Mark, welcome to the podcast. Eric, hello. Thank you very much for having me on. Yes. So let's kick things off by just having you briefly introduce yourself. Who are you and what do you do? I am uh, Mark Sansom and I'm the, the content editor of the world's 50 best bars and the world's 50 best restaurants. Amazing. Amazing. Uh, it's a really interesting line of work, of course. Uh, I'm sure that you get a lot of folks who uh, come up to you and say, oh, must be difficult uh, just you know, going out and uh, sampling all this amazing food and drink. Uh, and I have a sense that what we're going to be getting into during this interview is uh, all the nuts and bolts and uh, some of the uh, nuances that actually make the world's 50 best possible. Um, so for those of us who, like me, may be familiar with the world's 50 best um, and may, for example, uh, I've, I've interviewed uh, Ian McPherson uh, from Panda and Sons. That bar was listed uh, recently on the world's 50 best. Uh, so, so I'm passing familiarity with the world's 50 best and what you do. But can you take us a little deeper and I guess explain uh, how the process works and uh, from both the consumer side and the restaurant side, um, sort of like what you're all about? Of course. I mean, how long have we got? We could probably take up this entire uh, podcast recording with the with the nuances and the idiosyncrasies of uh, the world's 50 best bars and the world's 50 best restaurants. But I'll certainly try and give you as tight a snapshot as I can. Um, so, yeah, the, the world's 50 best restaurants is the is the sister brand to the world's 50 best bars. And that was established in 2002. Uh, over here in the UK. Now, the the actual genesis for that it was just um, it was a feature idea in a magazine which um, we're called Restaurant Magazine, which unfortunately no longer publishes a print edition. But it was the editor's idea at the time to you know say you know what I want to compile a list uh, globally of the world's fifty best restaurants. So uh, he at the time sought out a very very small academy of roughly twenty people from all over the world to to vote for what they believed were the the best ten restaurants restaurants in the world at that time and they created a list now that has that has evolved uh, up until last year when we had an academy of just over a thousand voters for the world's 50 best restaurants um, it's actually a very very simple system um, the the voters uh, are asked to name their their favorite restaurants in order and then we with the help of Deloitte simply compute those votes and then turn them into a list so yeah, so the world's 50 best bars uh, launched in, in 2009. So we're a slightly younger organization than, than restaurants, but we certainly have learned a lot from our experience in the, in the restaurant field. And yeah, so this year we, or last year now, we published our 13th edition of the world's 50 best bars back in December, based on the votes of 600 uh, panelists from all over the world. That is quite impressive. And one thing I, I want to zoom in on is how you've underscored the simplicity of the voting system, because, I mean, before you mentioned that, my question was going to be, how do you wrangle that many cats? How do you like with, with over a thousand judges or, you know, with, with multiple hundreds of judges in the cases of the uh, the world's 50 best bars, like, that the complexity just seems to be out of control. And yes, we're living in an age of Zoom where you can instantly connect like you and I are with someone uh, across the pond or across the world. But, uh, but certainly before Zoom, it, it seems like a colossal undertaking to organize that many people. Um, so I, I guess, uh, how, how, do you, how do you select, what is the selection criterion that, you use to, uh, I guess, invite someone to become part of the academy that you mentioned? Of course. Yeah. So it's, it's quite uh, an involved process, uh, as, as you can probably imagine. Um, so yeah, of those 600 panelists, each uh, region of the world has its own panel. So in 2019, uh, we only had five regions split by continent, which were managed by five academy chairs. Now, those five guys did an absolutely superb job in um, in reaching out to the respective bar scenes uh, in outside of their region to get the most appropriate voters. But what we thought in, in 20, 2020, which was actually my, well, I joined in 2019, and uh, my remit was to kind of devolve those those panels. So in 2020, we uh, established another another seven 
17, uh, another 17 regions to take us up to 22. And this year or last year, 2021, we have now have 28 geographic regions. So uh, my remit and what I was trying to do with the brand is to essentially create those academy chairs in those 28 regions who are more closely tied to their region's bar scene. So while you're very, very accurate in uh, the, the wrangling cats analogy, particularly when you're dealing with bartender voters, as I'm sure you as I'm sure you know, it's actually it's actually the work of those 28 Academy chairs who who do the majority of the wrangling. So I essentially speak to those 28 people all over the world and then they select their panelists. So it's kind of um, kind of passed down the chain, the wrangling. I love it. I love it. It's very uh, it. it reminds me of military efficiency in that you've got, <laughs> you know, one commanding officer who speaks to, you know, a number of lieutenants who then go on and delegate responsibilities to their enlisted soldiers. So it makes a lot of sense from that angle. And uh, the other thing that I'd, I'd like to maybe press a little harder on is the impetus to and the value of getting more granular. You sort of alluded to it when you mentioned that, you know, these academy uh, chairs and, and then the, the other members of the academy would be more intimately acquainted with their smaller regions. What is the value of that? What Elaborate. What's the value of that in a competition or a, a, a judging system like the world's 50 best? Yeah, very, very, very good question, actually. Um, so it probably good, it's probably the best answer for this is to start with the ideology of what we try to do with the world's 50 best world's 50 best bars. And that is essentially to create a list of the 50 best bars and now our extended list of the 51 to 100 bars to create a list for consumers of the most, uh, the best expert approved bars in, in the world, ostensibly. Now, by devolving the regions and creating, creating more regions, we want to shine what we're calling the floodlight on a greater and wider number of bars and bar scenes. So uh, we established our first academies in, in Africa. Uh, we've had an academy in, in South Africa for quite a while, but we, we launched Africa East and Africa West in recent times. And it was very, very reassuring to see our first bar from Kenya make it onto the 51 to 100 list this year, an awesome, awesome bar in. Uh, in Nairobi called uh, Hero Bar. So it was really great to see them get the recognition. We've also launched uh, three new academies in Eastern Europe, which is a bar scene which has been on our radar for a very, very long time. Um, we're, we're always hearing of, of great bar experiences and, and great bar shows coming out of that region. And we kind of see it as our role to um, shine that floodlight outside the traditional cosmopolitan cocktail capitals, which we're which we're all familiar familiar with in terms of New York, London, Singapore. So, we're essentially trying to give those consumers who use our website and use our list uh, new ideas, new experiences to plan gastronomic travel and, and bar led travel for their for the years and months ahead, as and when uh, travel becomes a little bit easier. Yes, of course, uh, the pandemic has, I'm sure, made your job a heck of a lot more difficult. And, and I imagine that details about that will bleed in as we continue our conversation here. So I don't want to I don't want to pause on that too much. But what I think the, the last like really big question in my mind is is how is the world's 50 best different from some of the other judging or rating or evaluating organizations like the Michelin star system, for example? I, I feel like most of our listeners will perhaps be a little bit more familiar with that in the exclusive restaurant space, maybe not the bar space, mm. but uh, can you just elaborate on on maybe where you fit into the landscape with something like like a Michelin um, guide? Absolutely, yeah. And, and Michelin uh, obviously does a, a superb job uh, at grading and, and categorizing restaurants uh, all over the world. But the big difference between what we do and what Michelin does, Michelin has a, a set list of criteria for its inspectors who are anonymous to, to come up with and give their ratings. But what I feel very, very strongly about and something we feel extremely strongly about with 50 best is that our voters have absolutely no criteria in which they are to grade their bars uh, when they're when they're producing their votes uh, and the reason why we we do that is is it's essentially a lot of lot of trust that goes into those voters so we split up the voting panel of 600 so they're roughly 50 percent bartenders and bar owners 
roughly 25% uh, drinks writers and drinks educators, and the final 25% are what we call um, cocktail aficionados, which are essentially consumers who travel the world and are well au fait with, um, with dining and drinking, uh, and that they'll come in to, to create that last 25% of the voting, voting academy. So yes, we don't put any criteria in those in those voters hands we the what they consider to be the best bars is entirely up to them for that voting period so that almost emphasizes how important it is for our academy chairs to select the right panelists and in turn then we get the list of a very very varied group of people the distinction that you've just drawn is a really, really fascinating one to me. And it's something that I honestly came into this interview, like that that was not a dummy question. I wasn't just posing that question so that you could answer it. I was posing it because I was genuinely curious. And my initial reaction to that is, you know, if I'm holding the world's 50 best up next to the Michelin, what I'm seeing is that you have almost a permeable membrane in the case of the world's 50 the world's 50 best where you have uh it's almost porous in that like you're you're intentionally going out and selecting these people who are intimately acquainted enough with the bars and restaurants in their area where they probably have active discourse with these bar owners and and with the places where they are actually um evaluating whereas the michelin guide of course, we have this anonymity. We have a very set uh, number of evaluation criteria, and so in that respect, it's very rigid. There's there's a there's a separation between the person doing the evaluating and the establishment that is being evaluated, and it's interesting because that strikes me almost like a double blind experiment uh, uh, in in the sciences, right? It, it, it's a little bit more. Um, I guess sterile would be the wrong word, but there, there's a there's a separation there. Whereas the world's fifty best, you you also go out of your way not to provide any selection criteria, and that to somebody who's listening, uh, just you know perhaps driving in their car, who's not thinking too hard about this, that that they might kind of cock their head and say, well, no selection criteria. Like doesn't doesn't that result in a little bit of a chaotic list? But to me, the initial reaction that I have is that the lack of selection criteria leave room for rapid evolution, which in an age of COVID seems to be something that is really taking place in the service industry. And it allows room for surprise and delight. And if you've got a bar that opens in a given area that's just doing something so vastly different and so delightful in comparison to everything that's around it, something that's really pushing the envelope, it seems to me that a judging without so many set criteria would be more welcoming to that as opposed to something that just has like a set of criteria that is set in stone and based on, you know, it, almost like the the French uh, culinary orthodoxy that had, exactly. that dominated the U.S. dining scene for mm -hmm. for so many decades. So I don't know if I don't know if you'd like to comment on that. I don't know if if you agree or disagree with that evaluation. No, I I, I, I really enjoy that porous rock analogy. Actually, I might well uh, I might well borrow that myself. That's uh, that's that's a really good one. But I mean, yes, while Michelin would say that that's to to maintain consistency, the other big difference with us is we can only ever in one uh, in one one year or one list we can only represent those 50 bars and then the 51 to 100 a maximum of 100 bars per year michelin obviously has no limitation on the number of of stars that it that it, that it can give out so we know we, we know and we realize the importance that we have that we can only highlight those 100 bars year on year uh, and so that's it's important for us that there's a lot of diversity in there and there's a lot of change year on year and i think the biggest uh the biggest example of where where our process is successful is the different style of bars which have made it to number one in recent years so uh the world's best bar in 2021 was was connaught bar 
which was also the world's best bar in 2020, which is a super luxurious, uh, wonderful five-star hotel establishment with amazing service and huge, a beautiful David Collins designed bar with some of the, the most, the finest leather upholstery you'll ever see anywhere in the world. But in recent years, we've also seen Dante in, in New York City, win, which is a, which was a very, which is a very, very relaxed aperitivo bar serving coffees in the morning, uh, great Italian food through the, through the afternoon. And of course, some of the, some of the best Negronis on the planet. And then previous to that, we've also had uh, the Dead Rabbit, uh, which is a completely different style of bar, totally win. And then we've also had similar hotel bars, such as Dandelion in London, and then the Artesian at the Langham Hotel in London, which won four years, four years on the spin. So just looking at those vast, vastly different style of winners, we're kind of, um, we, we, it's kind of feels kind of rewarding to us that we've got, we've got it right, that so many different bars can actually get to the top. And certainly looking at the most recent list, we've got everything from wonderful hotel bars, like I say, we've got those aperitivo bars, but we've also got dive bars have done uh, done really well this year. We've got uh, at number 11 is a an awesome Barcelona bar called Two Schmucks, um, which is a dive bar in its real rawest sense. Uh, and and they're, they're flying really, really high in the list and they're making some real progress. So yeah, it's, it's great to see the, the diversity of uh, of the style of bar in our list and it's certainly something we're going to look to perpetuate and, and bring in more of uh, as, the, as as we go forward with the brand it seems to be such a service to the industry to be able to highlight the diversity and and to really catch the spirit of the moment and i know that it seems you know pe- people constantly comment like uh Oh, it's, it's 2022. It just seems like it's still 2020 right now. So, you know, we're living in an era where time seems to be a little bit out of whack. But uh, if you think about the world's 50 best as this yearly um, occurrence, this yearly list that comes out, uh, it really does seem to catch the spirit of a, a very specific moment. And I, I think that's really valuable because, uh, you know, as, you, as you're mentioning, you know, for allowing people to, you know, plan their dining and drinking experiences uh, around travel that they have in that, that upcoming year, it really does provide a great service in terms of letting people know what's on the rise or what's exciting right now. Uh, and I think that's something that's just starting to become you know, part of my thought process now as I'm planning travel and other things. So uh, it, it is really timely that you and I are able to have this conversation. I love the uh, different types of examples that you were just giving. And I think now that we've kind of gotten a sense of what the world's 50 best is and does, I'd love to dig into a few more of those examples. Um, so you've recently published uh, this year's list. And so I'm wondering if you might talk a little bit more about some of the trends that you've been seeing. Um, you know, you mentioned some of the divier bars and you mentioned uh, the fact that we have uh, our first uh, Africa East bar making the list. Uh, any any other trends that you've been noticing um, as you have compiled this year's list? Yeah, I mean, I, I tend to try and stay away from trends as such uh, and sort of noting what, what we're sort of seeing, because I think, as you're alluding to mentioning, the, the zeitgeist changes so, so, so quickly. We're always coming into a different, a different sort of style and, 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 uh, and world in terms of how the, how the bars, bars approach it. But I think one thing that's really, really, really stood out from the bars that I've been speaking to and from the ones on the list this year is how important uh, and the, the, the level of, uh, of importance that people are putting on the hospitality experience. I think as we emerge from the, the, the pandemic and the, the, the myriad of restrictions that we've all had on our day-to-day lives and circadian rhythm in recent years, is that, that how important it's going to feel to for people when they're coming into a bar to feel safe to feel secure, to feel as if their custom is being valued. And the bars which have had real success this year are the ones which put the guest experience first. And as I'm sure your listeners uh, are well aware, the guest experience and that first contact point is that is, it comes for free. And that for me, it's more important than the, that the cocktails that are served or the decor or the glassware that the, that the drinks come in. That guest experience and uh, is right to the fore. And we've certainly seen bars which offer wonderful hospitality come to the top. Uh, it's also very exciting for us. Uh, the last or the, the, the current list of the world's 50 best bars is we have launched the Siete Mysterious Best Cocktail Menu 
award for the first time. So this one was particularly exciting for us. So as I was mentioning earlier about trying to shine a floodlight on bars, which might not have been uh, been seen before by the 50 best audience, this was open to any bar anywhere in the world no matter if they've never had a connection with uh, 50 best before and we were really really buoyed by the by the number of entrants we had we had uh, we had just over 200 uh, in the end and that was coming from uh, from Accra in Ghana on, on West Africa we had some great bars there we had uh, some awesome ones from remote parts of, of, of South America and Latin America and some uh, pretty random ones from um, all sorts of well one of the the, the most westerly uh, island in Japan a small tiny little bar which God knows how they found out about it but it was it was awesome to see all these um, see all these entries come in and the bar which ended up uh, victorious after the after the grading procedure from our 28 Academy chairs was a tiny little bar called Lab 22 in Cardiff, which is uh, which is in Wales in the in the in the in the west of the UK um, in a pretty unsalubrious part of town, which is actually known as Chip Alley uh, for an, and that's sorry for anyone who's uh, who's familiar with um, with Wales may well may well know that. But yeah, it was really, really great to see so many small uh, bars, which I hadn't heard of, come onto our radar and then in turn for us to be able to, to put them into the into the global spotlight. That's wonderful. I spent my 21st birthday in Cardiff. No it way. It did not go well. Yeah, it did, did not go well at all. What were you doing there? Uh, and and uh, uh, getting way, way, way too inebriated as uh, <laughs> a 21-year-old who had just been in the UK for several months and therefore had had the ability to legally consume alcohol. So it was a, uh, it was, it was, it was not a good thing, but uh, yeah, a beautiful city from, from what I do remember of it. Very friendly um, people. Very, very friendly people. In yes. Yes. And the, the beer there is called brains, but has, uh, has nothing to do with uh, the uh, human cerebral cortex. Uh, <laughs> Sadly, brains has just actually gone out of production. It's uh, yeah, unfortunately that was a, it was a victim of the pandemic, but yes, it was a, it was a fine drop. And I think they're trying to rehome the recipe somewhere, but the, that brewer is, is no more, unfortunately. Oh no. Oh no. Well, uh, getting back to the menu. I love that. that. That's such a wonderful addition to the world's 50 best. Uh, and I honestly, in terms of cocktail menus, I'd love to do an episode specifically specifically dedicated yeah. to that. Um, but uh, you know, one one question that did pop up for me is, you know, you've got you've got this this rating set. Well, it's it's a it's a list of one through fifty, and I'm wondering what the difference is. Uh, I know that you don't have selection criteria per se, but but in your mind, what's the difference between the number one bar on that list and perhaps the 50th bar, or, you know, if we're taking into account the 51 through hundred, you know, number one versus the, the last bar that, that just kind of squeaks in and mm. makes number 100. Very little is the, is, is the quick answer. Um, it's there's the margins between number one and number 50 in terms of, in terms of the number of votes are very, uh, very, very slim indeed. Uh, I, I can't actually give you the, how many votes it takes to get in there as, I, as I'm sure you can appreciate, but there's very, very little difference um, year on year. I think probably the best example of that was, um, was probably Dante in New York, which was our, which was the world's best bar in, in 2019. So not so long ago. Last year, Dante was number two. This year, they slipped down to number 30. And you can attribute that to a number of factors. Um, the lack of access the rest of the world have had to come to the, to the States and visit. Um, a lot of, perhaps a, a, di a different sort of approach in terms of their bar team that they, they've had a, a change in terms of the personnel behind the bar maybe but I think to be able to drop 28 positions in, in one year and there are other bars which have, have dropped far more it goes to show the uh, again that's sw that switch in zeitgeist which you mentioned earlier which is really goes to show that there are such fine margins in in people's votes and what they're what they're seeing as a great bar experience year on year so yeah very very little between the, the top and the bottom yeah, I, I sort of suspected that that would be the case. And, and as, you know, as we've mentioned, you know, pandemic, pandemic uh, time, pandemic lifestyle certainly has the effect of shaking things up on all fronts. I mean, just the sheer here in the US, the sheer fact of having to pivot to a to go cocktail model uh, or a to go mm. dining model is just such a, a crazy uh, magic eight ball of a situation. Uh, 
I, I mean, I just think about these poor bar managers and restaurant mm. owners trying to source the packaging yeah. for that takeout. Yeah. Uh, you know, just bottles and clamshell containers. It's chaos. And, uh, you know, with so little control, uh, it, it certainly does show the value of those establishments that do rise to the top. But uh, I, I don't I don't view it as a, a, a permanent uh, black mark against those who happen to uh, drop in the ratings. You know, as, as we say, this is something that changes year over year. You've got this really granular, um, you know, voting system. And, and so uh, to me, it, it doesn't really strike me as something that's uh, catastrophic. It's it strikes me as something that makes me even more curious to see what comes out in 2022. Um, so I've got a bit more of a philosophical question for you here okay. you know, in, in light of the, the COVID experience. And it, it has to do with the fact that we've, we've had this, um, you know, in the world of to-go, we have an experience where the, the physical act of being in the bar or being in the restaurant seems, you know, kind of forbidden. Uh, or, at le or at least here in the U.S., you know, with, with bars and restaurants in different states, uh, mm. opening, closing, being allowed to open again, yeah. um, it, it, it seems at least under threat, if not forbidden. And, and I'm wondering what effect you think that has had on dining experiences as somebody who's been witnessing this, not necessarily in the trenches, but from sort of like the zoomed out perspective, <laughs> being able to see how it's affecting various establishments in various parts of the world. Do, do you have any thought about the effect that this has been having on the space? Absolutely, yeah. And, and, and you're quite right. This is a, a topic of discussion, which uh, 50 Best Towers, we, we, we have a lot across both the restaurant and bar spheres. And I think probably the the best example or the best city to cite for this would be would be Singapore, where ha the restrictions have been have been quite conservative and they've been changing regularly all the time so at the moment in, in Singapore you can only you, you, your bedtime is 10 30 the curfew uh, and you're only allowed to you're only allowed to eat out with as in, in a group of five and that's only recently gone up from a, a group of two and I think what that kind of boils down to and as true as in Singapore as it is across the world where you know you're going to have to make a reservation at a bar for the duration of the evening and bar hopping or bar crawls are just too risky because you don't know whether you're going to get in. You're not sure about the, the protocol that particular bar has. Um, you're far more inclined to stay in one venue for a, great, uh, for a greater part of the or greater proportion of the evening as you may have done previously. Now, that has a number of knock-on effects in bars. I think probably the largest is that people and bars are now far more, far more considerate about the food program that they're serving. And those bars which offer an excellent bar menu or an excellent bar pairing with cocktail experience, um, they're the ones which have done really, really well in recent years in, in the world's 50 best list. Um, again, perhaps a, a good example of that in the, the list as, that, we, that we've just revealed is, um, is Tippling Club in Singapore, which got in at number 43 this year. Now, that's actually a re-entry to the list. Um, it, it, it fell out of the list for a couple of years, for three years, I think. And we saw it come back this year. Now, this is, this is a bar by a chef a guy called Ryan Clift in Singapore. Now, he puts a huge amount of emphasis on the pairing experience between cocktails and food. And I think the fact that it's made its way back into the 50 best list is a great indication that people are now looking to eat as much as they are to drink because those bar crawls are just either too risky or people don't want to do them. Yeah, and and the pairing aspect is is such a fascinating component because what we've had for the last couple of years is food and drink and the person who is consuming that food and drink colliding without the context of the setting where it is served and prepared. Mm. That context seems to be, it's almost like there's, there's a rift between the sustenance and the person who consumes it that is normally, you know, sort of taken care of by the setting in which it is it mm. is enjoyed and that pairing experience at least seems to bridge that gap a little bit so that people can say ah all right you know I, I may not be enjoying this in the exact way that I had two years ago or a year and a half ago but someone behind the scenes is leaving me a trail of breadcrumbs saying like ah this beverage is paired with this 
mm. very specific and you know thoughtfully prepared bite or meal and and to me that that seems like things beginning to get back to normal again that seems to indicate that people are thinking about uh how to almost retrain people to enjoy food and drink together, despite the fact that we really haven't had too many opportunities to do so. So I'm, I'm really glad that you um, drew out that particular example of, uh, of a food and drink pairing that was uh, doing really well and has the uh, therefore reemerged onto the list. And I guess as we wrap up the main portion of the interview here, I'm wondering if there are any other trends like that, like the food and drink pairings that you see emerging and that you see people being really delighted with as we mm. enter into 2022 and hopefully, you know, people can start doing things like getting on planes again. <laughs> Go looking forward to that. I can tell you. Um, yeah, I think just, just to follow on very quickly from, from your comments on the, on the pairing experience, it's, it's something which we're noticing a lot more of at 50 best. So during the, the, the prime pandemic period in the, the, the first half of 2020, we actually launched our first ever e cookbook, which we called home comforts and, the and the sales of that went to, to contribute towards the, the 50 best for recovery program, um, which we ended up raising $1.3 million for various hospitality businesses all over the world, which we distributed via grants. But yeah, that, that cookbook, we brought together chefs from the 50 best list and bartenders from the 50 best list. The chef would suggest a, uh, a meal, uh, sorry, a, a recipe from his from his, his or her stable. And then we would pair that with a cocktail from one of the, well, the world's best bar people. Um, so yeah, so we, um, we we gave the recipe and the ingredients to the to the bartender, and then they designed a, res a cocktail recipe to go with it. And for me, the, the response that we got to that was just outstanding. And it's not something we've seen a lot of cocktails paired with restaurants. I mean, wine being paired a part of the tasting menu is, is commonplace across the world. But to actually, we're actually seeing more cocktail pairs come onto the menu sure um, people can't be drinking uh, cocktails which are sort of 20 ABV times six or seven across the course of a meal but as we move towards those the lower the trend for lower ABV drinks longer drinks that's certainly gonna gonna come to the fore but but yes in answer to your into your in answer to your question I think the trends that we're, we're likely to see and, and one which is particularly exciting for me um, again the bar sector is kind of five to ten years behind restaurants so if we look to the trends that we've seen in fine dining over the recent years, we're likely to start seeing those spring up in, in cocktail menus all over the world. And the big one, the really exciting one for me is sort of fermentation and how sort of ferment, fermented ingredients um, are going to be finding their way into drinks over over uh, future years. Now, there's there's a, a chef, um, a guy called David Zilber, a, a Canadian guy who worked and he ran the lab at Noma, which is the world's uh, best restaurant at the moment. He's, he's since left to go and work for um, a, a science laboratory about and, and study fermentation at a more granular level. But yeah, I'm, I think what we're going to see in terms of liquids and uh, like hard product, which has been fermented, is going to really take off and start flying over the next few years. There's a great bar, uh, Penicillin in Hong Kong, which opened just about 18 months ago now, that really focuses on fermented ingredients. And obviously that helps with the closed loop uh, way that bars want to operate and, and, and a more sustainable future for the, for the products that they create. So, and we're only just start, starting to barely scratch the surface of the flavor profiles around fermentation. So for me, that's what I'm, um, I'm pretty excited about seeing more of in the, in the years and months to come. It also speaks quite a bit to terroir, which Absolutely. gets into yeah. why we travel or why we import particular products from specific places. So I think it's incredibly exciting that fermentation is such an emerging trend at a time when we're hopefully about to reemerge and be able to visit a bunch of new places. And uh, it also, to me, you know, one risk there seems to be, you know, I, I recall hearing that um, New York City has some pretty rigid regulations around uh, being yeah. able to do things like ferment in house. So again, like this is this is an interesting trend to identify because it's not something that will be done the same way everywhere around the world, mm -hmm. nor is it something that necessarily can be done to the same extent everywhere around the world. And I know that you're based in the UK. 
here in the US, one of the comments that we get regularly from people uh, who are not native to our uh, liquor system and our, <laughs> uh, our rules and regulations is that we're not one country, we're 50 different countries <laughs> operating you know, in contact and, and with various borders uh, alongside one another. So uh, that to me is, is something interesting to keep my eye on. I certainly will be doing that. Uh, and just to quickly loop back to the uh, uh, 50 best for recovery, 1.3 million. Uh, a, that's just, it's wonderful that you were able to give that out via grants of all mm. things. Um, you know, certainly no strings attached uh, is a great gift to be able to give a bar owner uh, in these times. And, uh, and the, the creativity with that, the, the remix quality of taking one dish and then giving it to a bartender or beverage director from a completely different mm. establishment that's the type of creativity that we haven't necessarily been able to experience in person for such a long time. So at least to have it in a digital or print format where, you know, maybe we could even uh, try and source or, uh, you know, try, try to come close to sourcing some of these ingredients and remaking these recipes in our own home. You know, there, there's a, an aspect of delight in that. So uh, just it, tremendously creative and uh, obviously also tremendously effective in its impact on the industry. So uh, congratulations on doing all of that. Um, thank you. It was, is um, there any... sorry, Eric. Uh, thank you. Yeah. I mean, it was, it, it was, it was quite rewarding, but the, the 50 best for recovery project was the, the very least we could, we could do really in support of the, in, in support of the industry. Now we ended up giving grants to restaurants and bars in over 85 countries uh, and roughly 250 grants in, in total. Now they were, they were generally around $5,000 in size. Um, and we also gave uh, money to bigger charitable org organizations, but yeah, we realized that uh, in lots of countries though, that $5,000 um, wouldn't touch the sides, but it might at least um, show them that there's people out there who care about them uh, and want to help support them. And if it sees them through an extra month or an extra two months, then then we've we've kind of we're happy that we've managed to support in in some capacity. But obviously, in certain countries um, such as uh, Georgia uh, and Albania in Europe, we 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 well just outside Europe, but um, yeah, in, in Albania and Europe. Um, it's been uh, it's, it's been really re reassuring to show that that money can go a long way and uh, and, and ensure the longevity of, the, of those of those bars and restaurants. So yeah, it was it was an interesting year for everyone, as as we all know. But one thing that I think you touched on there was um, the sheer creativity of um, restaurant and, and hospitality business owners and bartenders in coming up with ways to to stay afloat and make it through and and help their teams and and survive just one month after the next month. And yeah, I mean it certainly reassured my faith that um, that the bartending community is the one of the closest knit in the world. Mm, yeah, one one through line that I've been kind of following in this conversation is community. And it, it really seems like uh, the world's 50 best, both in terms of restaurants and bars. Uh, one one thing that, that your model seems to emphasize all the way through from top to bottom is community. So, um, you know, that's that's my main takeaway from this conversation. And uh, I hope that it's also something that our listeners take away and, and take confidence in because that community is now beginning to, you know, reemerge. It's been there all along over these last couple of years. And now we're being able to to see it and to participate in it again. So for that, I'm very optimistic. But Mark, is there anything else that, uh, that I missed. Anything else that you want to make sure our listeners take away from our conversation today before we jump into the lightning round? Cool. Yeah. I mean, I think we've been speaking quite a lot about inspiration for travel when, when borders open up and, and flights start, start, flights start reemerging. Now, I think the, the big thing that, that I'm looking forward to is, is setting those plans for this year and beyond. So we've actually recently launched something called 50 Best Discovery, which is, well, I would say this, but uh, in my mind, it's the most authoritative authoritative global gastronomic search engine that's out there at the moment. And we are really excited about this, actually. So we launched it in November 2019. Uh, little did we know that the pandemic was going to come around in, in February 2020 and curtail anyone's uh, plans of holidays and gastronomic exploration that year. But yeah, we launched it and we relaunched it this year, uh, sorry, last year in, in September. 
Um, and now that has two and a half thousand uh, restaurants and bars uh, loaded up onto it, all geotagged and and mapped through mapped through Google. So it's it's a very intuitive system. And what makes uh, Fifty Best Discovery different to the, the myriad other uh, search engines you'll find all over the world is that each venue uh, that's featured on their restaurant or bar has received multiple votes from our academy members, both across restaurants and bars. So when you make that booking using 50 Best Discovery, you can be reliably ensured that one of the world's leading uh, either cocktail, cocktailian or global gastronomic minds has selected it or recommended it. So we're really, really excited about people starting to use that and see that come to fruition. And then again, coming back to throwing that floodlight on a greater number uh, of restaurants and bars, not just those ones you find on our 50 best lists um sit so people getting in front of them and, and making new making new plans and exploring new areas which um which is what i love to do well it sounds like the 50 best discovery is a lot like having <clears throat> excuse me uh it sounds like it's a lot like having a friend who's very well acquainted with the bar and restaurant scene in any given area of the world that you may want to travel to and just being able to, you know, call them up or text them for recommendations. So to me, that's an extremely useful thing to have in your back pocket as we uh, begin, as you mentioned, booking flights once again. And, um, you know, certainly we will link to uh, all sorts of resources that we mentioned during this interview over at modernbarcart.com forward slash podcast on the show notes page for this interview. Um, so with that, Mark, uh, shall we jump into a few lightning round questions? Let's. All right. Now, what is your favorite cocktail? And if you don't have a favorite of all time, what's something that you've been getting into more recently? Yeah, good one. Good one to start. Um, I think my uh, my favourite cocktail would have to be would have to be a sazerac, a well made, a well balanced sazerac. Um, I like a good sazerac so much so that I actually, uh, my wife and I called our cat sazerac. So that's um, that would have to be uh, that would have to be my favourite. But I think the one I probably drink the most of, um, particularly in recent months, has to be uh, a Negroni. Um, purely because I, I'm not the best bartender myself, and cocktails involving uh, equal measure, equal measurements are, uh, are kind of within my wheelhouse. So yeah, I, I tend to drink Negronis when when I'm at home. So yeah, between between a Sazerac and a Negroni, um, serve me those, and I'm a I'm a happy man. Wonderful, wonderful. Uh, I think we need more cats named Sazerac in this <laughs> world. Um, He's actually quite uh, naughty, so uh, maybe not exactly like him. <laughs> <laughs> oh, wonderful. What is uh, a seemingly small or idiosyncratic event or occurrence that always makes your day? Oh, very good one. God, it feels quite profound. Um, I like the, the, the meditative process around my morning coffee, to be honest. Um, I, I tend to get up quite early. Um, earlier than earlier than my wife anyway, but um, that sort of 15 minutes I have uh, grinding some beans, um, putting them through my uh, rock espresso maker, um, frothing the milk. Yes, I do drink uh, milk with my coffee uh, in the morning, and it's um, it's cow milk as well. It's not even not even nut milk. Um, but uh, yeah, I think that 15 minutes I have to myself every morning making coffee um, is probably the the highlight of my day. I would say if it's um, if it's a day just around the house. Mm, mm, something that I can certainly relate to. I've, I've just started experimenting with grinding my own beans and doing the pour over process. So something I can certainly relate to there. Next question. If you could have a cocktail or we can extend this to a, a dram or a pint with mm -hmm. anyone in the world, past or present, who would it be? Where would you go? What would you drink? Just paint us a picture. No rules. Cool. That's a good question. Um, so I think... A guy who I've always wanted to share a bar stool, so sit at a bar with, um, would be my favourite author, uh, Irvin Welsh, who is a, a Scottish author who wrote the the, what, the Train Spotting uh, book, is, is his most famous, and the and the the, the, the novel, novella World, which has sort of spread out from that that Train Spotting series. Uh, I, I, it's only at the top of my mind because I'm desperately trying to commission him to write a feature for us at Fifty Best, but he's evading my uh, he's evading my emails at the moment. Uh, and I've seen I've, I've seen him across the room 
a number of industry events, but I've never actually got to sit down with the man and uh, prop up a bar with him and, and, and chew the fat. So you know, I think it would have to be Irvin Welsh in one of his traditional boozers in Leith in Scotland with a pint of tenants and then maybe a, uh, a wee nip to chase it down uh, and ask him where the hell the ideas for those characters came from. <laughs> brilliant, brilliant. Well, uh, Mr. Welsh, you are on notice. Uh, perhaps he's a listener of this podcast. Perhaps not. He lives in Probably Miami now, so you never know. Not. He might well do. <laughs> oh, okay. There we go. Uh, a little bit, a little bit different than Scotland. Uh, perhaps, uh, perhaps uh, if Scotland were turned inside out, Miami is what you would get. <laughs> Um, so that's, that's interesting. Maybe, maybe that, uh, maybe, maybe it's, uh, just a little bit of research for some of those characters that you were mentioning. Um, wrapping us up here. Um, do you have any unusual or controversial views when it comes to, uh, uh beverage or fine dining? Controversial views. Um, you know what, actually, I was, I was chatting to somebody this morning. Um, it seems very, very fashionable in, in the dining sphere at the moment to put sea urchin or uni on your or, on menus, uh, which has kind of come from the Japanese tradition. But now you'll find it on everything from from pasta to burgers. And I just cannot get on board with it. I know it's unfashionable, but um, sea urchin uh, gonads for me uh, are just not uh, just not in my uh, in my palate's sort of wheelhouse. I can't uh, I can't abide it. So sorry, chefs, restaurateurs who seem to put them all over your menus. I uh, uni is not for me, but I don't think I'm the uni one. God, that was terrible. Ah. <laughs> <laughs> all right, uh, I can't touch that amazing pun um, between <laughs> Sazerac the cat and and the uni pun. This has been one of my favorite lightning rounds in recent, uh, in recent interviews. Uh, so Mark, why don't you wrap us up just by telling our listeners how they can best, uh, engage with you and, or the world's 50 best, where can, uh, where can everything be found in the digital space or, uh, perhaps in the, uh, physical analog space? For sure, for sure. So, I mean, I think probably the best place to get to grips with everything that we do at 50 Best would be to start with uh, the website, which is worlds50bestbars.com. On there, you'll find the, the current list and indeed access to the 50 Best Discovery platform um, that we were talking about just now. And certainly on our Instagram channels at 50 Best Bars and at the world's 50 Best and at 50 best discovery and if anyone wants to reach out to me personally um i am mark sansom one on instagram beautiful beautiful well mark this has been a tremendous conversation on my end uh, really enjoyed getting in touch with you and and learning a little bit more about what you do how the sausage of a 50 <laughs> best bars and 50 best restaurant list gets made. Uh, I'm certainly going to be paying quite a bit more attention to what's going on in the bar and restaurant space uh, based on some of these trends like fermentation that you pulled out for us. And uh, yeah, uh, this, this is absolutely wonderful. And I hope that someday we do get a chance to uh, connect in person. Absolutely, Eric. It's been an absolute pleasure chatting to you. And thank you very much for having me on. All right. And uh, for everybody who is listening, you can head over to the show notes page at modernbarcart.com forward slash podcast for show notes. And uh, Mark, I hope you have a great rest of your day. And thanks for being a guest here on the Modern Bar Cart podcast. You too, man. Cheers. Cheers. <laughs>